session two here, with uh, starting with uh, Nathan Emery, senior lecturer in cognitive biology, uh, but actually he's a neuroscientist, and I would like to call him a corvidologist. Uh, he's been working with corvids for at least 15, 20 years. Yeah. And he's from Queen Mary University of London, and he will talk about bird brains make brainy birds. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thank you to Eric. It's a wonderful visit so far, and of course the weather is exactly like in the UK. Um, okay, so when we think of bird brains, we tend to think of stupid people. We use it as a, a term of insult. But actually, I'd hope for the, from Thomas's work and our own and a number of other people that these predominant views about bird brains are changing. There's a number of others in the audience I can see as well who are helping to, to change that perception of birds as being unintelligent animals. Now, the reason for this uh, uh, old notion, this ill-conceived notion about bird brains is from this guy who Eric introduced in his little brief introduction, Ludwig Edinger, who's getting all the hates today, um, a German neuroanatomist who basically um, believed in this idea of scale immature, this, this progression, this ladder, that animals go from simple to complex. But not only that, that their brains follow this pattern. So not only do you get uh, animals that are simple to complex, but their brains go from simple to complex, and they do so by adding things on. So you get a more complex brain, not by changing the brains themselves, but actually by adding things on to the brain. Now that we know now is, is, is not true. Brains will adapt and change, and they will increase in size or decrease in size, depending on the problems those animals need to face in their natural environments. Now what we now know as well is that there's a, a re close relationship between complex, uh, the cognitive complexity with the neural or brain complexity. So in this particular case of the bird brain, let's see if I can get this to work, although I've been told not to, po to point onto, no, I'm not gonna do that either. I've not been told to point on the screen, so we'll go, I'm going the wrong way, here we go. Here we go, can everybody see that little cursor? I'm not sure that's gonna work. In this classic view of the bird brain, Edinger suggested that majority of the brain was actually part of the striatum. So all this in the pink and the purple here is striatal, uh, uh, part of the striatal um, system, which is responsible for instinctual behaviour. Now, that's very simplistic. There's a lot of complex behaviour that occurs through the use of the, through the functioning of the striatum, but uh, it's a bit too much to get into detail at, the, at this sort of at this level. But basically, the idea was that the large amount of the bird brain was striatal, and it was named as such. So you would get the neostriatum was the equivalent of our neocortex. Whereas the human brain, or uh, mammalian brain, in the right here, is largely cortical. And the cortex, as we know, is involved in cognitive processing. So we have a bird brain that was thought to be just instinctual, and nothing to do with complex cognition. And the mammalian brain, and particularly the human brain, this is cortical and involved in, in intelligence. Now, Bill Thorpe recognized this in his wonderful book, which is still relevant to this day, even though it's 50 years, over 50 years old, called Learning and Instinct in Animals. And he said that the poor development in birds of any structure corresponding to the cerebral cortex of mammals led to the assumption among neurologists not only that birds are primarily creatures of instinct, but also that they are very little endowed with the ability to learn. This no doubt uh, no doubt this preconceived notion based on a misconceived view of brain mechanisms hindered the development of experimental studies of bird learning. So this idea of Edinger's actually had a, a detrimental effect to our understanding about bird cognition. Now, now we now know, and we have a modern view based on studies of neuroembryology, on uh, neurochemistry, on other forms of development and evolution, that actually the bird brain is largely paleo in structure, as Gerhardt uh, described in his talk earlier. So we see more now an equivalence between bird and mammal in terms of their overall brain structure. 
So now we have a sort of neural basis on which we can now apply our studies of bird intelligence to say, well, actually, now we can predict that we should see more intelligent behavior in birds because they have the neural underpinnings to do so. And this has led to some quite amazing discoveries from many labs to show uh, convergence of very different aspects of biology, behavior, and psychology across different animal groups. I'm particularly interested in the one in the middle, the corvids. That one's a Eurasian jay. And the primates. So I started off working with primates and then worked, started, moved on to birds, mainly because my wife got me interested in birds and told me how wonderful they are, and I agreed with her. But we can think about what's called convergent evolution, and thank you, Thomas, for describing what convergent evolution is, so I don't have to go into it. The idea that you can come up with similar ways of solving problems to similar uh, to those similar problems. So you can actually come up with a similar solution to solving uh, different types of problems. And there's some suggestion, at least in these groups of animals, that we show convergent evolution of intelligence, and it may be based on these different parameters. But you don't need to read into lots of these different things. There's too, too many. But what this has led to, at least in corvids and apes, the, the species I work with, is an idea of convergent minds. So these two main groups of animals, and we can now think about including parrots and elephants and uh, cetaceans, the dolphins and whales, where we have convergence in the way that their minds might work. And my wife, Nikki Clayton, and I wrote a review uh, 13 years ago now, which makes me feel a little bit old, um, in which we described what we saw as being core components of a cognitive system, a cognitive toolkit, we called it at the time, which underlies that convergence. Now, this may be, I'm finding it difficult to disagree with Lars's talk, but it may be something that would push birds and primates above what the honeybees can do, or even what the octopuses can do. Because I don't think that we have actually seen good evidence in the bees for any of these four aspects, but we can disagree. Lars and I are in the same department, so we can argue with each other all the time, as we like. So what interests me is how this mental convergence, this convergence of minds, how is it possible, despite these two groups having vastly different brain structures? So on the left, the section through a bird brain, and again, as Gerhardt uh, demonstrated in his talk, the bird brain, this avian pallium, which is equivalent to the cortex, is nucleated, so we have groups of neurons that are, are sort of in little blodges, if you like. It's sort of uh, like a fruit cake, which is Onaguntakan describes it. Compare that to uh, a layered cake, which is the mammalian cortex. So they, the cortex there has a various series of layers. And you get connections between those layers but you also get connections across layers in the mammalian cortex, whereas in the pallium, you're getting connections with it between different nuclei in that structure. Now, I think what's going on that gives both of these groups their intelligence is something called a small world architecture. Now, this was developed in, in economics. It's how, let's say, you, you interact with your small social group a lot. So if you're on Facebook, for example, you may interact with your family and close friends much more than you do with somebody you may have uh, been at school with 30 years ago. It's something equivalent. We don't see something like on the left, which is a highly ordered network where everything connects with everything else. My mum doesn't collect, connect with all my friends, and I don't connect with all hers, and so on. That would be in a representation on the left, where we each connect with everybody else at the same time. That sort of system would be chaotic. We also don't see what is in the middle of a randomly connected network where we just interact with other individuals without any particular reason. We have a reason, they're friends, they're family, we have close relationships. What we tend to see is this on the right, this small world architecture, which leads to a modular system. We, we have interactions with pockets of individuals, and then we may speak to others that may be at a distance or we don't see very often. So we get something called this small world architecture. What we see, we think we see, in both the uh, mammalian and avian brain, and particularly in the ape and corvid versions, 
uh, this small world architecture. Now I'll get to how we, how we get that idea in a second. So when we see this small world architecture in a brain, it relates to what's called modularity. So you have a module that uh, is involved in a particular process, a particular function. So it may be a very specific function or very, maybe very general. But what's interesting here is we see convergence in what are called the connectomes. So this is the connectional network of a brain. So which brain areas connect to which others. And surprisingly, we see great convergences even within something like a pigeon, which is this on the left, and the different colors represent different functional modules in the pigeon brain. The one on the bottom right there is a human brain, and again, it's a much more complex network, but we're still seeing these little modules of function in the different areas of the human brain. The macaque on the top right there is drawn in a different way, but again, the colors all relate to areas which have a similar function. So they're grouping together. The ones that connect more profusely are cl located closer together. So we're seeing convergences, even at the level of a pigeon and a human, in their connectome. And we think that's, particularly, that's a particularly interesting, interesting aspect of these, of these different brains. So that might be something that's leading to this convergence. So how does this occur? Gerhard, Gerhard alluded to this earlier, that um, we've now looked at, at not just brain size in these animals, but we've looked at the neural density. And the surprising fact is that corvids and parrots have two times as many neurons as primates of a similar mass in their paleo structures. So there's the example on the left there, a Eurasian jay, which is, their brain is 2.85 grams. An owl monkey, their brain is 10.62 grams. And yet the Eurasian jay has 100, I'm trying to think what level these are in millions, aren't they? I mean, uh, uh, even a tens of hundreds of millions more neurons than the owl monkey. You see the raven, again, is a quarter of the size, their, pal their pallium to the cortex, as the capuchin monkey, and yes, it has more neurons. And the same for the macaw there, it has more neurons than the macaque monkey, which has a brain that's five times greater, four times, five times greater. So we're having a brain that's much more dense with neurons. What does this mean from an, an engineering perspective? So the consequences of increasing this density are different for the different species. Now, if you increase the density of neurons, they either have to get small, if you're going to keep the, the wiring in place, which is what birds seem to do, or you change the way the wiring is set up. So they have a laminar system. So by that laminar system, you have, the, if you remember the, the laminated cortex I showed you, that's what we call the gray matter. And then we have the white matter, which are the long axons that run underneath but you're also getting some connectivity inside the cortex itself. Birds don't have a white matter, so they're having connections within their pallium. Now, birds have a problem. So birds have to keep their brains small for them to be able to fly, and because they're largely bipedal, so for them to keep upright and not drag their heads on the floor, and also for them to be able to take off, they have to reduce their uh, their brain weight, and also their bones are hollow, again, because of flight. So they don't have the structural integrity to hold up a heavy brain. So what the birds do is that they have to, their, their brains have to sort themselves out into this sort of small world architecture where they have these interconnected networks of local connections and then some long, uh, longer connections to once they've, they've finished their local processing. So we might see something like this. This isn't an actual bird brain. I couldn't find any. There are no, not many. I have to steal one from Gerhardt. <laughs> I don't have many uh, histological slides of, of bird neurons. But this hopefully will get across the idea. Is that in, say, the avian pallium, you have lots of neurons that are tightly squeezed together with lots of these smaller interconnections. But to do that, to fit those number neurons in, you have to shrink the neurons down, and you then have, can have certain selective longer connections compared to the primate cortex, where you might have fewer neurons, but you can have these much more longer 
selected connections going through the white matter. So how do primates get across this idea about squeezing things in? And I'm going to do a little practical demonstration, hopefully. <laughs> if we can come on here. Can everybody see this? This tennis ball is supposed to represent a skull, a primate skull. I hope you can see the, the, the similarity with your own. If, let's say you have a sheet of the cortex. Let's say it's this size. Everybody see that? It fits quite nicely into this skull. But then, of course, you're limited in how big your cortex can be. What happens if you need to fit something in like this? So if you can see there, this piece of paper. What primates seem to do is this. Now we can fit lots more neurons in to the same brain space. You see that? So primate brains fold themselves, so they fold in on each other. So you can fit in the comparison, say, between a, a folded brain and a smooth brain. Oops, they're not showing up at all. They are. Never mind, you can see there. <laughs> a smooth brain and a folded brain. So even though the primates have uh, half the amount of neurons as the, as the corvids, they have this mechanism, this engineering solution, to s squeeze in more neurons into the same brain space. Now, birds do something maybe different. Is Perhaps you might have this rolled up paper and then put it in water. That's the equivalent, I would say. And then you can fit that in quite nicely because then the, the neurons are sort of mushed in together. OK, I can turn that off now. OK, so we're in a meeting about the thinking animal. So what does this actually mean for avian cognition? I'm, I'm not going to go into many experiments, um, largely because of time. But we know that, at least in, in corvids, we, they can do a lot of incredible things. We've shown in my lab and my wife's lab, for example, that they can plan for the future. And Matthias has done a wonderful recent study on ravens, also showing planning for the future. They can think about others' perspective. And again, like, like uh, Thomas's ravens, they can think about others' points of view, about where they should, should look if they want to steal food or hide food from others. And they can also solve novel problems. And that's what I'm going to focus on here. So we did a, a, task, a, a task recently, which we've not published, and this is on the ravens at the Tower of London, which is a group I've been working with quite recently, because they, they have a, a quite a, a, a dear connection into the British heart, because if they leave the Tower of London, then Britain will fail. But I, I did check, on the, we were actually there on the day of Brexit, and I did check that the, the ravens were still there, and they were, so we can't blame the, the ravens. Um, but what we've been doing with the ravens is looking at the efficiency of their processing because what we think their brains are doing by this small world architecture is making their brains quicker, they're more responsive, and they can learn things more rapidly and become more efficient in the way they process information. I'll, I'll describe this or in a sort of very simple task called this, we call it a spaghetti tower task, although it was originally called Corvid Kaplunk. I don't know if that's a game that you have in Sweden. But basically, it's a tower, a perspex tower, with spaghetti slotted through. And there's a, a mouse, which is one of their favorite treats. The tower ravens get spoiled. And the mouse is on top of, um, rests on top of some of these spaghetti. And they just have to pull the spaghetti out in order to, to reach it. And there's lots of different uh, iterations of this, which I won't go into. But what the, the birds do is very similar to the traveling salesman problem that Lars mentioned earlier. They go in the most efficient manner to solve the task. So they don't just pull randomly the bits of spaghetti, they're pulling them in the right order in order for them to get the, the reward in the quickest amount of time. We've also given rooks, which you're all, I'm sure, very familiar with here in Sweden, uh, a series of novel problems all based around tool use. And this is all work of my ex-student, Chris Bird, who that wasn't the only reason why I took him on as a student, because he was called Bird, although it does help. So um, Chris and I designed a task, because rooks don't use tools in the wild. So compared to, say, the New Caledonian crows, the very famous New Caledonian crows, rooks don't use tools in the wild. So we wanted to test their causal reasoning. Do they know about the effects of, 
of causes and their, uh, sorry, the, the relationship between cause and effect. And we wanted to do this through using tools. So we shaped them on this, this task here, which is a, it's called a collapsible platform task. I tried to be, get it called the Bird and Emery collapsible platform task, but nobody has taken that on, unfortunately. Um, which is basically this structure here. There's a, a platform that has food on the top that's held up by a, a very weak magnet, and then a vertical tube on top. And then the bird has to place an object into the tube for it to balance, off balance the platform so it can release the food. Okay. And they learn this very, very quickly. And then we can use this task for them to see if we can learn about what they understand about us if we change the diameters of the tube or give them different objects that require uh, them to understand different things. Now, you also see there's a series of cartoons, and they'll come apparent about what they mean later on. But basically, they're the bits of information these birds are picking up when they learn these various tasks. And so we, showed that we gave them a, a series of different tasks. Please don't uh, worry about this. I'm going to go very quickly on it. But it's just showing the pattern of tasks that we presented these birds about whether they would understand the size and shape of using stones, whether they could transfer to using sticks, whether they could use or understand the properties of water with using certain tools, and then some more complex things, which I'll get onto right now. So the birds could rapidly learn on their first trial, in fact, in many cases, to uh, use an object as a tool and then adapt if they, let's say, the, the tube was bigger than they needed to use, whether they would use a bigger stone or a smaller one if the aperture was smaller. They also started using uh, sticks instead of stones if we gave those as available. But they also started using more complex tools as well. So rooks can use hooks, which I love the, the headline. Um, so this is a, a now a, a, a vertical tube, but now it's got a little bucket inside. That's what's down there, and it's got a treat in. And they're given a tool, which is like one of those at the top right. So uh, a stick with a, a V shape on it. And this is, I'll always show you the first trial in which these birds get these. So this is the first time this bird has seen this task before. And of course, it doesn't use tools in the wild. So it's only before inserted sticks into tubes to push down on a platform to gain a reward, not to put something in and then pick it up. So here's one case. They have previous experience of using a stick to push it down, or, pl or place it into a tube, push it down, and then get a reward, not to push something down and then retrieve it. So they have this experience of not only just using wooden hooks, but also in choosing between hooks that are functional, like with a V-shape, or non-functional, where your V would be inverted, so it would not be uh, useless as an as active tool. So we want to go on further. Well, could the rooks actually make their own tools? Could they create something? And there's been previous work in New Caledonian crows in a famous crow called Betty, in which she would make a hook uh, from a, a straight piece of wire. So we gave our rooks the same task. And again, this is the first trial. So you see, it, it makes the hook on the top, using the top of the, the tube there to bend. It always has a look. And then interestingly, it flips it over. So it knows the right, the functional end. And through perseveration, perseverance, it eventually gets it out and gets the treat. No, no, it's that the hook was over the top. So it used the actual top of the tube to do it. As you can see here, you don't need to get into much information here, but three out of our four birds spontaneously did this on the first time they were presented with this task. They only did it four times each in total. Well, that was the best performance. But actually, I've been looking at the results, and the, a lot of them, there they give up. They know what they're doing. They're making the hook. But actually, because their beaks are so long, they have problems in very fine manipulations. So they, they're actually making the hook, but they're not successful with them because they, they can't manipulate them in a certain way. I'll show you that. I might, I'm not sure if I've got the time. Um, oops. 
where there's one here that I don't think this is going to work. No, unfortunately. Oh, well, we'll just have to skip that. But in this one, there's a, a, vid a video of a bird who's actually... Can, it, it's about five minutes, so it's probably a good thing I can't show it, but he keeps trying to make the tool. He keeps going back and checking it, putting it in, it keeps flipping out, it might spring out and it has to check, and then goes back and checks it. So it's, it's actually, it seems to be directed in towards the, the goal of the, of the task, but it just unfortunately fails to, to get the reward. So I think that what's going on with this sort of task is that this modular brain, this small word architecture, is essential for solving these sort of innovative problems. Because you can put together in the core brain past experiences that they've learned for this task. It's not that it's insight. I used to say a few years ago that I think that what the birds are showing is insightful problem solving. Whereas actually, I think it's that they're just piecing together subtle parts of information that they've learned in their past experiences. For example, so you can see there their, their, their use of this collapsible platform their uh, use of hooks, the way that they were able to pull out and use those hooks in certain tasks. Perhaps they so had some experience of wire in the past. And they put all those relevant bits together in the right context and then rejected those that they find not important. I think I'll probably finish there because that's all that that's just saying. But basically this idea that perhaps what we're seeing with this small word architecture is important for all intelligence in, in many different animals, probably including ourselves. And just a plug for my book, which has been, which has been published for over a year now. If you're interested in bird brains, then I, I guarantee that you will really enjoy my book, and it's got lots of nice pretty pictures as well. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, we have time for two questions. I wonder to what extent have you been noticing differences in, in intellectual capacity between the, the birds in your experiments? So individual differences between birds. Yeah, I mean, in the, in the wire bending task, we had it was an interesting quandary because we had four birds that would, we, we could uh, do the experiment on. Unfortunately, uh, an oak tree fell on the aviary, and so we couldn't test any more birds, and luckily they all survived. But what was interesting with those two birds is that um, two birds created hooks of one type, and two birds created hooks of another type. So one, one pair created a sort of S shape, so that it looked like they'd bent on one side, picked it up and then put it in and bent it on the other. And the other pair had bent, as you saw in the video, so a hook on one side. But the interesting thing is that it was within a pair, so the, a bonded pair, they both, create, both pairs created their own type. So it was almost like they went back to the, the roost at night and said, I had this great experiment I was in, I, I had to bend a, a, a hook in, in this shape, you ought to do the same. So it was almost like they communicated in some way, but who knows how they, how they could do that. I'm sure that's not true, but it was you know, it's an anecdotal thing with four birds. So. so yeah, but we do see an awful lot of individual differences as well, but they do sort of conform to, to sort of the same way of doing things eventually. One more speedy question. Here we talk about the ravens uh, all the time, but what about all the other birds? Are they, all the other birds are smart, or these are the smartest? <laughs> that, I mean... <laughs> I'm not a big fan of, I mean, even though I use the word intelligence a lot, and, but saying about one bird is smarter than the other because they all have adapted to their own particular environments. I mean, I must admit, if you read my book, I will be very disparaging about pigeons. Um, and, and I've been on record about pheasants, especially after running over a few of them. Um, but I, th I think in terms, we, we're obviously, we're studying things from probably a top down approach. We're, we're looking at what do primates do and do the birds do the same? And we just happen to have chosen species that do the same. So the corvids and parrots. If I started studying rheas and ostriches like Matthias is doing, which I'm, I'm supposed to be doing soon, um, we probably won't be seeing them bending wire into hooks and, and fishing with them. But there's probably something that the ostriches can do that the corvids can't. So whether it's intelligent or not, it's something that they've adapted well to doing. 
but it's up to us to to, dis to determine what is smart about what they're doing. And I'm not so keen as as Gerhardt is in in having a scale of, you know, this animal is smarter than another. I don't I don't think that helps us very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>